Okay. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, nice to be back here again. And um, I wish I were there in person. Uh, I feel like I'm right at home uh, singing the hymns and looking out at the audience. Uh, I feel like it's I'm at my own meeting. Well, nice to be back with you again, and we're going to continue uh, in our series. And by the way, I noticed it's Palm Bible Fellowship. Sorry about that. But uh, we're continuing our series on the promises of God. And uh, in this message, we're going to consider the topic of the Lord's purposes in me. Uh, if you remember, we launched this back last month, and we used the verse from two verses from Second Peter chapter 1. And verses three and four, as his divine power is given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him, that's the first part, by exceedingly great and precious promises. And so that's what Peter uh, reminds us of. And it's one of the many precious things that uh, Peter refers to in his epistle. <clears throat> in our first message, we talked about, we actually combined two messages in one. We talked about uh, the promises that God has given to us. So we illustrated that from the life of Jacob in Genesis chapter 28, when Jacob uh, acknowledged the fact that the Lord was in his presence. And when he woke from his dream, he said, surely God is in this place. And this is nothing other than the house of God and the gate of heaven. And God had given some wonderful physical promises to Jacob. And we mentioned at that point that there are parallels in the Christian life, that even though the promises that God gave to Jacob about returning him to the land um, were physical in nature. There are spiritual promises and parallels in the life of the Christian. And just as God assured Jacob that he would surely bring him back, that he would certainly bring him back, we can think of the verses that remind us that God is true and faithful in all that he does. That's his title, the Lord's title in the book of Revelation. But also, it is a reminder of all those wonderful verses about the security of the believer and the assurance of salvation that we have in Christ. And one of my favorite verses, and you'll see it on a lot of my stationery, is Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he that began a good work in you will complete it at the day of Jesus Christ. And so we launched it with the life of Jacob, but then we continued on and talked about Jehoshaphat, and how some of those promises that God has given is in regard to his abiding presence in our lives and his protection of us. And that's not to say that every believer has an invisible uh, shield around them that nothing at all harms or hurts the believer. Think of Job and think of some of the, most of the disciples, all of them except for one, uh, suffered uh, for their witness for Christ. But when we come into situations we have the resource at our disposal to call upon the lord and ask for his help just like it was seen in the life of king jehoshaphat and we looked at second chronicles chapter 20 uh, as an example of god's promise of his presence and his protection and so when jehoshaphat was out in the battlefield in chapter 17 uh, rather chapter 18 he called on the lord and the lord delivered him from that situation Again, in chapter 20, when he was in the battlefield, he called upon the Lord and the Lord protected him. So it's a great reminder to us that God does have his protective hand on us all the time. And there's nothing that happens to us if that doesn't first come to him and uh, receive his uh, consideration, his approval, whatever you want to call it. And a reminder to us that God indeed does protect his people. Um, last time that we met, we talked about his power through us, uh, in particular, in personalizing it, his power through me. And uh, we looked at all the he is able passages that are found in the New Testament. Great reminders to us, again, of his exceedingly great power toward us, to them who believe, and the fact that he is helps, helps us in our time of uh, trial, all the uh, he is able passages. Now, today, we want to take a look at this concept regarding the promises of God, his purposes in me. And we want to illustrate that in the lives of his disciples in particular. And we can go to a lot of different portions of scripture. 
But Matthew chapter 14 is what we want to look at today, beginning at verse 22. We'll read that in just a moment. The next time we meet in a final four message series, which will be next Lord's Day, we'll look at his place for me. And that's illustrated from verses in John chapter 14. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you and so forth. And then Revelation chapter 21 and 22, the wonderful promise that he has a place reserved for us in heaven. And so that's what makes up this series. And uh, today we'll be looking at, once again at this concept, his purposes in me. So let's turn to uh, Matthew chapter 14, if you haven't turned there already, and let's read at verses 22 down to 33. Immediately, Jesus constrained or made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. When he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And so he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? But when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And God, as he promised, will bless the reading of his word and knowing that uh, it'll accomplish that which he pleases, as the scripture says, and it will not come back void. <clears throat> So considering uh, this concept of the exceedingly great and precious promises of God, uh, we think of a great verse uh, found, a couple of verses found in Jeremiah chapter 29. I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. I incidentally like the New King James rendering of that verse. Old King James says, I give you Thoughts of I have thoughts of peace towards you, not of evil, to give you an expected end. Now, it means the same thing, but uh, thankfully we have wives who are helpful to us in ministry. And one time I was going to see somebody who was recovering from a stroke and he was doing really well. And I was going to write him a little note and I put Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. And he had been really seriously ill. And, uh, you know, it was kind of half and half, but he was getting better. But uh, when I wrote it out, I wrote the King James version of it, and it says, "I think of thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a, an expected end." My wife says, "Maybe you should try a different verse than that verse." <laughs> so I always like this rendering of it. But you know, it is a great verse of the reminder of God's love toward us, His thoughts of peace, not of evil. He's got a great plan in store for each one of us. Uh, we know that because eventually we'll be with Christ, we'll see him face to face. Uh, the shadows will flee away, Song of Solomon says, and uh, we'll see our savior. And uh, sin and sorrow will be banished and everything that we know about, which we'll talk about next week, will come into reality in our lives and uh, faith will give way to sight. Wonderful prospect that lays ahead for us. But until then, we need the promises of the Lord to help us uh, in our walk with him in this scene, this scene which is a wilderness wide. And uh, we need that encouragement. Thankfully, we have the ministry of the Holy Spirit as we looked at in a uh, series that we had with you uh, some time back. Just to remind us of these wonderful promises, remind us of the scripture, remind us of God's presence in our lives, remind us of his protection, remind us of all these things. And these are good verses for all of us to know. If you haven't really committed that to memory, I really want to encourage you to do so. So what are his purposes in me? And I say in me because it's dealing with inward transformation. 
Uh, Romans 12 tells us not to be conformed to this world. That's an outward pressuring to be like the rest of the world, but rather to be transformed. And that word, as you probably know, is metamorphosis, which is the same concept that a butterfly would have coming from a cocoon, a caterpillar into a butterfly. That inward change, that dynamic change, it changes something that is not so attractive to something that's very attractive. And from a spiritual standpoint, that's what God wants in our lives. He wants us to be conformed to the image of his son. And Colossians chapter one and verse 27 says that Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what the Lord, Lord wants in each one of our lives. Every one of us. He's not looking for us to be filled with Bible verses and filled with knowledge and just go on our way and being able to spout Bible verses. Instead, he's looking for that inward transformation, that change that we are in his image, made in his image. And that's progressive sanctification. There are some who in, in the Christian world who would like to think that we're walking along and all of a sudden God will zap us and we enter into a new dimension of spiritual power and vitality. The scripture doesn't teach that. There's no uh, principle of tarrying and waiting for the Lord just to, just to hit us. It's a matter of yielding ourselves to the Lord, reading his word, praying, asking the Lord for help, separating from sin. And that is a progressive process. And that's why it's called by some progressive sanctification. It takes time. But uh, the more we flirt with the world and the more that we compromise, the longer the journey, the harder the journey, the more roller coaster journey we'll have in our Christian experience, our Christian walk. The ultimate goal is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we see that in other verses as well. In Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 29, uh, this verse, which a lot of people are familiar with, they are familiar with it with the front half of it. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. We understand that uh, trials have their part in our walk with him. But what is the purpose for those trials? Well, it's for whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. God's ultimate goal is for us to be like his son. So we are to be conformed. If there's any Conformity to take place is to the image of the Lord Jesus. So Romans 8, 28, uh, good verses for many of us we are familiar with, no doubt. Younger people here in the audience, uh, it's a good verse for you to memorize as well and be aware of. In Galatians chapter 4 and verse 19, Paul reprimanded the Galatians. That was a group of believers and a group of assemblies. So he wasn't talking to one particular fellowship. He was talking to a number of them. And he says, my little children for whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Interesting how he words it, by the way, travail in birth again. So he had travailed for them for their salvation. Uh, Spurgeon had a great sermon that's in print called Travailing for Souls. And what that means is we don't just walk up to somebody and instantly they're saved. That can happen. Happened with Paul. But probably paul uh had people praying for him for his salvation when he was called saul of tarsus and uh yeah, that was a result of i'm sure much prayer most of the time there is a, a a bit of a process it's spontaneous salvation no question about that but somebody hears the gospel over and over again and people praying bathing it in prayer and really asking the lord to break through that's travailing in prayer for birth to take place, just like it is in the natural world. But then Paul was praying and travailing again for them until Christ be formed in them. <clears throat> so there's another travailing that takes place. And that takes place in the process of the maturing of believers to be more like Christ. What would it be like if uh, everybody was on the same page at the same spiritual level. Some of that you see in Bible conferences, which is great to see. And that's why Bible conferences uh, can really encourage the Lord's people because people are there voluntarily. They want to be there. And so the spiritual level is much higher. It's easier to preach at a conference in some ways. They're bigger, maybe, in terms of numbers. But it's easier because everybody is 
pulling in the same direction. Local assembly in a lot of assemblies, it's uh, entry level, so to speak. And so there may be some who are not necessarily walking close with the Lord, yet they're still there. It's the process of birth, uh, of, of maturing the believer. In some case, uh, people coming to know Christ as Savior when the gospel is preached, even through songs like you were just singing a little while ago. But the next process is maturing. And Galatians 4, 19 reminds us that there is this desire that the Lord has for each one of us to have Christ formed in us. So we become more like Christ, conform to his image. So basically, God wants to deepen our faith and conform us to the image of his son. That's his purpose in me. And that's what we're looking at. And he makes sure that there are some promises and some words to speak to this. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.5 says, Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and a faith unfeigned or sincere faith. So this is the purpose of commandment is that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, and that love is from a pure heart and from a clear conscience, a good conscience, and from true, genuine faith. First Peter 1 Peter 1.5 reminds us of that uh, threefold uh, a purpose that God has in mind, the purpose of the commandment. So we're looking at the purposes that he has for me. So how is this accomplished? Well, trials do that work. James chapter 1 and verses 2 and 3 clearly speak to this issue. My brethren, James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. How do you count trials a joyful thing? Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. There are some I noticed that are on uh, Zoom, and I'm sure many in the audience as well have gone through various trials to one degree or another. Some walk through the deep valley in their experiences, and it, uh, it is tough to go through. And we pray that the, we often pray that the trial would end soon, and yet God has his purposes for whatever so that he would be glorified through that whole thing. And uh, it it brings forth patience in our life. So let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. So James 1 uh, and verses 2 and 3 speak to this area. Now, the example is given to us in Malachi chapter 3 and verses 2 and 3. Uh, let me read those verses. It's a great verse, a great concept. Uh, I'd rather read it so I can quote the whole thing directly. Uh, this is what it says in Malachi chapter 3, speaking about the nation of Israel. God says to them uh, it, in, uh, again, chapter 3 and verse 2, but <clears throat> who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? He's like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap or launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purify over silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. The concept that is uh, being spoken about there, Malachi to the nation of Israel, is that just as a refiner and purifier would sit over that uh, melted metal, he would heat up the pot that would be filled with metals, and up to the top would come the dross, the impurities, then scoop them away and then what would remain would be purified metal, almost like a mirror, so that the refiner and purifier of silver who's leaning over it can see the reflection of himself as a result of the heating up of that substance. And in the same way, trials come and they have a way of helping us identify the dross in our lives, that which is not of the Lord, that's which is not of true faith. And the idea is that they are identified, done away with, so that what is left is that which gives a perfect reflection of the person of Christ working in us. And so like a mirror, he wants to conform us to the image of his son. He uses trials to accomplish that. So Malachi chapter three, verses two and three uh, are a real good example of that. So we read uh, from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33, and this is the illustration in the life of the disciples of how God uses trials to accomplish this. Now, it's easier said than done. I realize that. This is not flip. This is uh, 
we realize there are serious things that are being referred to here in this portion. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> as we look at this, we consider it in our own personal lives. What is God wanting to accomplish? So the first point I'd like to bring out is the reason for this whole event. In verse 22, it says Jesus had immediately uh, gotten his disciples together and made his disciples get into the boat. Old King James says constrained. He forced them into the boat. For what? To go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Just before this, the 5,000 men were fed, much larger group, of course. And the multitude was there, both disciples as well as followers of Christ, as well as those who were just there for the food. But when it was all said and done, he sent them away and got his disciples into the boat. Uh, I say this reverently, put them in a boat and then pushed the boat off from shore and got them out into sea. Now, the idea is that they had a purpose. Their purpose was to serve him and represent him. He was going to send them to the other side. This is different, by the way, than Mark chapter four, when he was in the boat. This time he is not in the boat. He sends his disciples across the sea to do service for him and to represent him. It speaks and underscores the principle of the Lord giving us work to do. We're not meant to just huddle and enjoy the meal like they had done just in the previous verses, the 5,000 being fed, well, the whole crowd being fed and enjoying that experience. They could have stayed there for weeks, I'm sure, had enough food and they knew that the Lord could multiply it. So they'd be content just to stay there and enjoy that food, enjoy that experience. A lot of arguments that could be made. Why, why leave? It's a great experience. We're enjoying ourselves. But he, they had a mission to accomplish. There are other people to reach. There are other things to, to do. And so he puts them in a boat, constrains them, made them get into the boat. That's the, that's the point. It is a uh, responsibility that they have that they can't shirk. And the Lord was making sure that they understood they got something else to do. So he puts them in the boat and sends them out into the sea. And that sea of uh, Gal the Galilee uh, would be representative of their field of service, we might even say, or their journey to the field of service. We can even say it that way. Committed service to the Lord is what everyone is called to do in the Lord. Everyone has the responsibility to serve the Lord. And they are given spiritual gifts to do so. Well, that's the reason for them going. Now, the Lord doesn't send us into any field of service, any doesn't give us any responsibility without giving us the resources to equip us and enable us to accomplish what he wants us to do. We looked at that already, the enabling, the empowering. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He is able, he is able, he's able to help, he's able to subdue, he's able to do all these things. <clears throat> well, what we read about in the next verse, verse 23, is that he, when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was alone there. It is a picture of the intercessory work of Christ. What a great picture it is. The disciples are down below. They are making progress, at least for a point, in their service and the representation of the Lord, while he goes up and prays for them. That's what is taking place here in verse 23. And that's exactly what the scripture teaches in Romans 8.34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is risen, also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. And so the Lord is giving us work to do, but while he gives us work to do, he just doesn't leave us alone and say, you're all on your own. He gives us the resources and the resources are himself praying for us. In our ministry to represent him and uh, we see another verse that uh, refers to it i don't have it here but uh hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 let me read you that that's another verse of course we have the holy spirit interceding for us we know that from another verse in romans romans chapter 8 but also in hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25 
Therefore, he is able, once again, he's able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So he always lives to make intercession for them. And so we can count on the fact that if we are doing something for the Lord, he is praying for us. We may not, we don't see it. We have to stand on the word and know it's true that he is praying for us. And we can be very busy for him in a lot of different ways. But it's important to be reminded these are the promises of God that he's praying there for us, as it says in his word, Romans 8, 34 and Hebrews 7, 25. The, the understanding and the acknowledgement of that in our minds and our hearts is what's going to fuel our service for Christ and keep, help us to keep at it when we may not feel like keeping at it. So it's that resource that he gives us. Why do we need that resource? because there's a resistance. And uh, in verse 24, we see that take place very clearly. But the boat was now in the midst of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. So what a tremendous picture this is. Not only for individuals and their ministry for Christ personally, but corporately. I mean, just think about it from a pandemic standpoint. I mean, it's great to have Zoom. It's great to have these resources that were there already. They were there before all this happened. We weren't using them as much as we perhaps should have. But now we've been kind of forced into it in some ways. So now we see a whole different world open up and technology, and some like it, some don't like it. But let's face it, it gets the word out further to a lot of people. It's not quite the same as being all in place. I would love to be there. I do conferences, as many of you know, and it's great to have the speaker in place because he can interact and mingle with the conference crowd or whatever it might be. But if you can't have that, boy, this is the next best thing. And I'm glad to meet you and talk with you and, and have some sort of connection with the assembly there in Arizona that I would not have had, perhaps, if it weren't for this. And so... This pandemic, though, has created, at least in the back of our minds, a, a sense of there is some adversity going on because there are laws that are changing and legislation that are changing that are contrary to the scriptures. We know that. We don't apologize for that. We stand fast for the Lord, at least we should, on all these things. So there is adversity. There, the wind is blowing. The wind is contrary. There's winds of change. Acts 28 reminds us of the winds that Paul had to go through in his sailing, moving the gospel from here to there. There was contrary winds that threw him, I don't say threw him off course because it was the Lord's will, but brought him into other areas of ministry where people came to know Christ. It was because the winds blew and they were contrary. But wherever Paul went, he brought the gospel with him. So even if it was contrary, there is still victory there spiritually in Christ. And so there are winds of adversity. There are contrary winds. It, it is difficult. The waves are there. Uh, they're in the middle of the sea. It's not like you can get off and tie the boat up and then you know go on to something else. They're in the middle of the sea. So it's not an easy go. And then uh, fourthly, verse 25, it says it was the fourth watch of the night. That was the deepest, darkest part of the night. And so a lot of adversity taking place. And Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 says, A great and effectual door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. So there's a lot of adversity. But the Lord can help us overcome that because he's praying for us. That's the resource we have in this period of resistance, this pushback against making progress. And it, it may be in your personal life that you are going along and you're thinking everything's fine. All of a sudden you get hit with a trial or something, some adversity that is impeding and hindering your progress personally, your walk with the Lord. Same thing for the church through the centuries even. There's always going to be the world, false teachers, false doctrine, 
uh, the prince of the power of the air, here it is, wind is contrary, right? It's going to be, be pushing against us so that we don't reach our destination or he tries not to keep us from reaching our destination or makes us fearful that we won't even though we will. So there's a lot of adversity that's taking place here in this portion. And uh, it's a reminder to us that uh, there is adversity to this whole matter, but the Lord can help us out. How can he help us out? Well, <clears throat> gives us the reassurance that he's with us. That's the next thing that we see in verses 25 through 27. It says, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. Now, it's interesting, in the parallel account in uh, John 6, it says that the Lord would have passed them by when he came down out of the mountain. Don't forget, now he's up in the mountain. The Lord's up in the mountain praying. Now he's going to come down and visit them in the midst of their trial. And anyone that ever goes through a deep trial, they're wondering, Lord, can't you please stop this? And maybe the Lord will stop it in time, short order. Maybe it's an extended trial, whatever it might be. The Lord is working his way in our hearts and our lives during that time. And uh, he comes to us and he wants to just, just like he did here with the disciples, and he just wants to remind them that he's there. So he would have just passed them by. And I take that from John chapter six, that he just wanted to let them know that that he was nearby, that, uh, that his presence was there. That's one of the promises that we've talked about. Well, he was there, fourth watch of the night. The Lord didn't come the first watch of the night or the second or the third, but the fourth. I mean, Abraham was about to offer up Isaac. That knife was in the air coming down when the Lord changed the situation. So a lot of times the Lord's intervention may not come until the fourth watch of the night. But he promises his people that he'll be with them and be with them forever and he'll abide with them. And so here the Lord comes to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples, 26, saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying it's a ghost, and they cried out for fear. They were even more fearful about what was taking place. When we go through trials, we have not passed this way before, as the scripture says. And they were going through something new and even more fearful, even though they probably were aware of the fact that the Lord was there, but just didn't know him in that way. He appeared differently during that time of trial. They saw another aspect of his personality that they had not seen at other times in ministry. And so maybe that made him fearful. When Paul was in prison for his proclamation of the gospel, 2 Timothy 4.17, everybody had abandoned him, his friends, everybody, only Luke is with me, he said. You know, Crescens had departed and uh, Titus and others. Demas, having loved uh, the world, the present world. But he says, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me that all the Gentiles might hear. And also I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. <clears throat> and so the Lord gave his assurance that he was there each day he comes to me with new assurance uh, you know even more and more i feel his tender care so it's during those times of trial that we sense the presence of a lord in a vital way and perhaps a different way than we've ever known before and so some of those trials actually have a silver lining to them uh, it's no more just these are Bible verses that are good. There's a real sense of genuineness and reality in our walk with the Lord. And that's what First Peter talks about. Now, the next point that we see is the rescue that takes place. And um, the verse, uh, before I even get to that verse, I want to bring focus on that second verse. 
1 Peter 1, 5 and 6, that we're kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. And what's the next set of words? That the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried by fire, might be found in praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The genuineness of your faith, the reality of it, not just, I know the Lord and I know this Bible verse. It's a closeness to Christ. And so that's what we see here in this section, because the Lord's words in verse 27 are immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. So this is one of the three cheers of Christ. You know, you heard this uh, three cheers for this person. Well, there's three cheers of Christ. And this is the cheer of his presence. In our conference uh, we had back in March uh, with a number of different brethren ministering, uh, Brother Rex Strogdon from North Carolina he didn't speak on this portion necessarily, but he talked about the cheer of his presence. And that's the idea, <clears throat> the sense of the Lord giving help and hope in the midst of trial. He says, it is I do not be afraid. And so he may be saying that to you during the time of trial right now, maybe in your walk with Christ. Peter answered him and said, verse 28, Lord, if it is you, Command me to come to you on the waters, and he said, Come. There's the Lord's gracious invitation, always the gracious invitation for salvation. Come unto me, all you that labor and every laden, I'll give you rest. The gracious invitation for uh, service to come and serve the Lord, and for a uh, rest in the Lord. Take my yoke upon me, and take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. You shall find rest for your souls. And so there's this invitation, always an invitation, that the Lord calls us to a deeper walk with him. Not some mystical, uh, strange goings on, but very logical. He is calling us to draw nearer to him in our heart, in our walk with him. That first prayer of, uh, of Paul to the Colossian believers, he says he wanted them to grow in knowledge and the wisdom of God. That's the first part is Bible study, adding understanding to Bible study, and adding the scriptures. But then after he goes through it, then he says that you might increase in the knowledge of God. The knowledge there is a deep experiential knowledge something that is deeper than just the facts this is knowing something i i know a bunch of different people but after you spend time with somebody you really get to know them and appreciate them and that's how it is with the lord and so he intercedes for us like he did with peter and peter's experience from it where it was much better but peter is willing to step out Step out of the boat. He, all the other disciples, they're there, but they're kind of watching. Peter is the one that steps up and says, Lord, if it isn't really you, call me out onto the water. He's willing to take that step of faith and go further in his experience with the Lord. And so when Peter come down out of the boat, it says he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Had it not been for this trial, there would not have been that experience that Peter could talk about later about the Lord delivering him, frightening as it was. Uh, yet, Peter took that step of faith. He's a believer already, so he already knows the Lord. So he's not talking about salvation here. He's talking about deepening his faith. And that's what the Lord's purposes are for each one of us, that we are conformed to the image of Christ, that uh, we deepen our walk with him, and all the other verses that we talked about, Christ being formed in us. And so when he had 
seeing that uh, the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. He was even more frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Quick prayer, three words. And the Lord did save him. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him and said to him, oh, you little faith, why did you doubt? It's like, almost like Peter's getting reprimanded for it, but he's not really being reprimanded, but he's saying <clears throat> to Peter, why did you doubt? I wonder what the disciples in the boat were thinking. Maybe they think, well, he's saying it to Peter, not saying to me. I know enough not to step out in the water. Well, <clears throat> Peter had a deeper experience to share. That's why these verses are great. Psalm 40, verses 1 and 2. I waited patiently for the Lord, inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. Great verse of testimony. God's wonderful working in believers' lives. Later on, I would say, that so others may fear the name of the Lord. That's what happens. We have a deeper message. Remember hearing a speaker one time say, we have a responsibility not to broaden our message, but to deepen it. If we deepen the message, God will take care of the details. He'll broaden it. Uh, the idea is to walk close with the Lord. Then you become a real help, practical help to others uh, in their Christian walk as well. That's the rebuke. Oh, you have little doubt, a little faith. Why did you doubt? And they were learning the lessons. And that's what we need to learn as well. <coughs> in Luke chapter 24, <clears throat> in verse 25, the disciples that were on the road to Emmaus then were spoken to by the Lord who said to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. When it comes right down to it, uh, those words apply to us, don't they? Foolish ones, slow of heart to believe. Uh, sad to say, I can say it in my own experience, how slow at times, many times, all that the prophets have said. It's already there. It's in the word. We're just slow of heart to believe. Well, what's the result? We see the results in the last two verses. When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. And they were already believers, but they were deeper believers afterwards. They showed their vulnerabilities. They showed their frailties. Uh, Peter certainly did. He didn't, you know, have the purified faith at that time, but the Lord took care of him. The Lord helped him, caught him immediately. That's a great picture of the security that we have in Christ, caught him. First Peter 5.10, we shared this verse already about the life of Jehoshaphat, the peace that comes afterwards. May the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you've suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. And that's what happens. Uh, the following verse also gives a little extra insight into that one. And this is a, a found in First Peter uh, chapter 5, but... Let me just read you that. Uh, after you have suffered a while, perfect, established, strength, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. The Lord gets all that glory. And so we see this episode in the life of his disciples, the Lord's disciples, and the result of a faith that is much deeper. Now they get to the other side where they were uh, destined to go in the very beginning, and even though they had adversity, even though it was in the midst of the sea, even though it was fourth watch of the night, the Lord brought them through. They got through and they worshipped him, and they said, now we know you are the Son of God. Now they knew that before, but now they really knew it from an experiential standpoint. And so that's the purposes that God has for each one of us, wants us to deepen our walk with the Lord. It goes back to the very beginning. Or we refer to these things. That's what the Lord has in mind. It's the promises that he's with us. He, he assures us all the time uh, that he is there and uh, that eventually we'll be with him. So we're thankful to the Lord for his grace, grace to us, his mercy for us.
all the time and his love and care and keeping. And the Lord loves you and me very much. And he wants us to walk with him and invest in uh, spiritual things that will bring glory and honor to him. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you again for all that you do for us. Thank you for your love and your keeping and your care for us, your compassion. Lord, thank you for the promises in your precious word that help us along in our walk with you. Lord, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Help us to realize these things, to be done with those things. As the hymn says, the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So we thank you, Lord, for your promises. Thank you for the assembly here in uh, Phoenix. And we ask your help and your blessing in all that they do. Encourage them in their hearts and each one in the assembly as well. We ask this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.